but a pet ain't one. Sorry about that, Joseph. I did tell myself to say something. Um, again, welcome. Thank you for joining us. I'm Sarteka from Fat Crops, and this workshop has been brought to you by Fat Crops, San Diego River Valley Conservancy, I Am Green, and San Diego Gas and Electric Company. Please feel free, if you haven't already, to introduce yourself in the chat and say how you're feeling today. So I'd really like to begin today with a brief like visualization. Um, it's a little breathing exercise. You can close your eyes if that feels comfortable for you, if that feels safe for you. Um, you can also leave your eyes open, but I'm just gonna walk you through a little imagery. Um, I just ask that you're very intentional in your breath. So uh, be mindful of the oxygen that you're taking into your lungs as you inhale and um, be very mindful as you, as you let go of that exhalation. Um, if you're in a space where it's okay for you to, try to make that like a, a mouth exhalation um, and try to make your inhalation through your nose. Okay. So imagine that you're out earthing, you're barefoot, or maybe you're wearing your favorite shoes, those ones that make your toes feel like you're walking on clouds. Everything around you is beautiful and growing, lush. Everything is bright and colorful. You see greens and oranges, blues and purples, just bright, beautiful, vibrant colors all around you. You can hear beautiful sounds. Everything is just very, very into your senses. You stop for a moment to look at the flowers and to feel the roots of the trees beneath your feet. You stop at this one particular scene where you see this amazing flower in this background. And this flower is just very, very beautiful and it's drawing you in. And you reach out to touch the flower when suddenly this cute little insect lands on your hand. Think about what type of insect it is and what does it bring up for you? How do you feel when that insect lands on you? Now take another deep breath in and then an exhalation. And if you closed your eyes, you can open them at any point as we come back. And if you feel like sharing, a couple of people can just unmute themselves and share what insect landed on their hand and what feeling came up for them when the insect landed. So like for myself, I will say it was a butterfly because I love butterflies. They're so beautiful and peaceful and I just, they make me feel great. So if we have anyone who wants to share. You can also put it in the chat. For me, it was a ladybug. I love ladybugs. Me too. They're so awesome. <laughs> How did it make you feel? Giddy. <laughs> That's so sweet. I love that. Anyone else want to share theirs? You can also put it in the chat if you don't want to unmute. I also had a ladybug on me and I felt privileged that it chose me to land on there. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. I do love that. And I should remember that more often. <laughs> Excuse me. I will be more mindful of that. Thank you. We could probably take one more person if someone wants to share. All right. So again, thank you so much for joining us. Um, 
please make sure you check us out for our next workshop, which is going to be a plate to plot introduction. We're going to be talking about upcycling food scraps, turning them back into fruit, food, and um, slightly we'll be talking about compost. Uh, as you may already know, or if you haven't, and this is your first time joining us, we switched from a hybrid event to a completely virtual event just for safety precautions during these times. So um, thank you for joining us. And if you haven't already, um, check out the registration because we like to just update you if anything changes. And we also want to send out a certificate of completion at the end of our workshop series just to thank you for joining us. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, for those who aren't already familiar with my story, um, I'm Sarteka Nafer. Let's see why my screen didn't want to change for me. Maybe it's this. There we go. So I am Sarteka Nafer of Fat Crops. And Fat Crops is providing healthier alternatives to communities, reclaiming our people's sustainability. And this is a little bit of how my journey into food justice and environmental justice and how that began. Um, also, before I, before I end, um, this is a collaborative event brought to you by San Diguita River Valley Conservancy. And I am green as well as San Diego Gas and Electric Company. Please check out their websites if you're interested in finding out more about the amazing things they're doing in the community. This is a picture of a food forest. Um, the idea of is that everything is interconnected. This is kind of like an ode to how I was raised and how my journey in food justice and environmental justice kind of is everything is cyclical. And so the idea of fat crops or fat crops original um, plan is to create a food forest um, actually in a food desert. So um, that is something that we're currently working on. And the idea of a food forest is completely integrated and completely holistic. We um, also wanted just to mention that how we got started was through a community garden plot at Mount Hope Community Garden. And from there, we were introduced to Sister Maria Mohammed from I Am Green, who is amazing. I love her so much. Thank you for everything she's done. Um, she had got me involved with the environmental um, Climate Ambassadors for Environmental Justice Program. And through that program, I further developed uh, the idea for fat crops and for the food forest. And then um, Sister Maria also um, introduced me to San Diguito River Valley Conservancy, which kind of ha is how, the, how we came to be here today with our workshop. So. Today's workshop is 99 problems, but a pest ain't one. Um, and the idea behind the, uh, the uh, quotations here is more into the conversation about what we consider to be a pest. And I'll get into that as we get into the workshop. Um, but today we'll be kind of troubleshooting insects and um, some issues. Okay, so with that being said, <clears throat> what are some of the undesirables that you have in your garden? You could unmute yourself or you can put it in the chat if you want to take a second to um, just type it in the chat. Or if you want to unmute yourself, just think about what are some of the undesirables in your garden? Aphids. Aphids? Mm -hmm. Did you unmute yourself? What else do we not like? <laughs> Rats. You see some mealy bugs. Oh, rats. So bugs. We see some ants in the chat. Gophers. Gophers. Let's chat tomato worms, <laughs> which you can see in this photo as well. Um, so yeah, totally these things are, for many people, would be considered undesirables. So I heard many people say the, the pest side of it, aphids, rats, ants, all of these different things. 
I didn't hear a couple of things um, about like weeds. So I wanted to just cover weeds just briefly. In these photos, you see a tomato hornworm, which it was a big little guy and he was tearing up my, um, I had some very beautiful black tomatoes. They barely had a chance to start to turn black on the top because this guy was eating holes through them. Um, and then you'll see some red wrigglers in the middle. These are inside of a worm bin that I started. And then you'll see a beautiful, beautiful little grasshopper. Um, so yes, I'm actually gonna start. I will talk about insects just next. I'm going to go into talking about weeds first. Um, so a weed is anything that's growing where a person doesn't want it. But have you ever heard the saying that one person's weeds is another person's medicine? Actually, there are so many different weeds that when we can, well, what are considered common weeds that are medicinal and edible. So let's see what we have. We have a few pictures here on the screen. If anyone wants to put in the chat or if they want to unmute themselves, you can identify any of these and tell me whether you think that it's a weed like obnoxious and unnecessary or whether you think it could have a purpose that could be beneficial. The fourth one down looks like a weed. The first one on top? No, second one underneath the uh, dandelions. Okay. Oh, you identified two. Great job. Yeah. Well, that's morning glory, stinging nettles. That one, I, I don't know on the lower right. I, I can't remember that name, but it's supposed to be maybe uh, work like aspirin or something like that. That's the one I'm thinking about. Okay. I don't know the one in the middle down. Any other guesses? Me? Uh, arugula? I don't know. No, that's okay. Anyone else want to uh, see if they can identify? See, you identified the first one is dandelion. Um, you got the nettles. I think actually the morning glory is, it was actually a different plant or what you thought was the morning glory. Beautiful. Um, so maybe someone might know that one or one of the bottom ones. The bottom left, you were right. It's more of a grass. So I guess it would be considered a weed. Anyone else want to unmute themselves? Or let's see if we have any answers in the chat. Oh, I see someone got it. Plantain. Yes. Great job. Great job. Yes. Oh, we see some other dandelion in the chat. Okay. So the first one, dandelion. It's considered a common weed, but it's also uh, medicinal and edible. Um, you can boil them. You can eat the greens. You can boil them and make syrups and it's a really amazing green, actually. So if you ever get into foraging, that's something that you can um, really get into. They're free if you know where to look for them, where they're not going to be um, polluted by smog or um, other pollutants, animals, and things of that nature. Um, underneath the dandelion, we actually have a picture of some crabgrass, which is so annoying. <laughs> it's actually like it, you know, it has its purposes. Everything in nature has its purposes. But if you have ever pulled crabgrass out from a plot, you know what a bane that is. I've actually, I like to go without gloves um, because I like to just get my hands in the soil and I've had blisters from pulling crabgrass. So it's strong. Um, this middle, middle photo, um, it's a beautiful flower. And we would think that, you know, we of course, we'd love that to grow in our garden. This is actually a picture of something that started to grow in my plot at Mount Hope. It actually came and started to grow around some of my beans. And I was like, this is really beautiful, um, but I need to know what it is. And I did a little research and I couldn't figure it out. And I said, well, look, if I don't know what you are and you're not edible, unfortunately, you have to go. Um, and then later I found out it's actually called bindweed and they grow up and then they suffocate whatever your plant is. They take the nutrients from them and they vine up them and they're actually not really as beautiful as they look. Um, underneath that we have plantain, which is a, considered a common weed, but it's highly medicinal. 
highly um, nutritious. It's, it's a, a wonderful plant. It's something that you should have in your um, emergency kits or your first aid kits because it has a drawing property to it. So you can actually draw out poison or toxic using plantain. Um, it's just an amazing plant all around. Um, on the right hand side, we have stinging nettles, which are also highly nutritious and edible. Um, they are considered toxic and a common weed. The toxicity comes from the stinging aspect where if you get it on your skin, it can cause a rash or like um, an itching or stinging. Um, use gloves when you handle it because they're still very, very nutritious and very medicinal. And then underneath that actually, um, this is the, what was that one that I put? Oh, I have it right here. It's the ground sole. So this actually has little barbs on them. And so they will, um, they kind of poke you too. And they say that they're um, highly toxic. So this is a weed that you would actually want to pull. Um, if you were to see it in your garden, I would probably use a small shovel um, to just get out from underneath the roots to pull it out. Let's see. Yes, plantain is highly edible. It's amazing. Okay, so I have um, just this image here. These are some edible, or, um, well, they're edible or medicinal weeds, quote unquote. Um, and then you have some edible or medicinal flowers. And then on the right hand side, you'll see some uh, more invasive or obnoxious and also toxic weeds. Um, so some examples of an invasive or toxic weed would include bindweed, which you saw a picture of, also poison sumac, um, crabgrass. Uh, when we get into edible flowers, not edible and medicinal flowers, we have like African marigolds, chicory, English daisy, nasturtiums, which are also um, super beneficial as a trap plant, but you don't want to eat the one that you use for sacrificing because it will be highly infested. Um, some uh, um, of your edible and medicinal weeds, quote unquote, would be the dandelion, which you also saw, purslane, um, uh, plantain, the, the common mallows, um, sheep sorrel, wood sorrel, some broadleaf docks, curly dock, which um, actually there are some of these on here. You'll see they have little warnings if they're toxic to cats, dogs, or other livestock in case you fin um, you decide you want to like have uh, plants and animals on your property. Um, and then there also are a couple that have lookalikes that are toxic or poisonous. So just be careful when you're foraging in the wild that you make sure to identify your plants correctly um, before you do eat them. Or if you're growing them from home, make sure you're getting, um, you're eating the proper um, plant actually. So a pest, which um, is one of the largest, the things that we talked about in, or we're talking about in this, this workshop is an undesirable insect or an animal. It's usually one that's considered to cause harm or damage to either your agriculture um, or to your livestock. Um, so that's just like the common definition of it. Um, so like growing up, I would say I was always afraid of bees. I used to think that I, well, I, I'm allergic to wasps or something that they got into. I get an allergic reaction from it, but I'm not actually allergic to the bees or the pollen that they're in, which I learned later on in life. But when I was younger, I didn't know that. So I was afraid of bees. I would run from them. I would swat them. Um, and it actually took me getting far more into gardening to like understand bees and like have a respect for them. Um, so like, I wouldn't consider them to be a pest, even though I'm afraid of them. And I wouldn't, uh, I would be a, I would be kind of more nervous when they buzz around my ear and I'm like trying to guard it. And I, I do still kind of like flinch, but I wouldn't consider them a pest. Um, so um, if anyone, oh, well, we already talked about what some other people have mentioned. Some of the pests that you mentioned are here. Um, but we do have some also beneficial pests. So 
Someone mentioned in, um, when we were talking about the undesirables, uh, a mouse or a rat. So you'll see a cat here as um, a predatory animal that will hunt those if you have that as a pest problem. Um, in the middle, you'll see a praying mantis. It's actually uh, tearing up a lizard right now, which I thought this was an amazing photo because when I think of praying mantises and when I bought some um, commercially for my garden, I was just thinking of the bugs. I never knew that they could eat larger like critters, like lizards. So this kind of just was really cool for me. Um, and then in, on the right-hand side, you'll see some snails, which are undesirables. You don't want snails um, getting a hold of any of your plants. They will leave slimy trails and chew through your leaves, or I'm not sure how they chew, they digest your leaves, but they will leave holes in your leaves. Um, on the bottom, underneath the snails, you'll see actually two undesirables, um, ants and aphids, which I heard a lot of people mention the aphids. Um, these little guys will tear up your plants as well. And the ants, um, they actually will farm the aphids. So if you were to like take a power sprayer and just spray the aphids off, the ants will actually go find the aphids, grab the aphids and bring them back to the plant because the aphids secrete a sweet substance that the ants like to eat. So the ants will, um, they will continue to bring the aphids back. And so if you can control for ants while trying to control for your aphids at the same time, that will be very beneficial for you. Um, in the middle, I thought this was a cute photo because he's sneaking a little bite and he looks busted, right? Like off someone's nanny cam or something, the deer in the middle, he just looks like caught, like, okay, you caught me. I'm sneaking some of these things. Um, and so if you live in more like um, wooded areas or areas that are more off in the outskirts and not in the middle of the city, you may consider deer to be a great uh, pest uh, if that's how you want to view them, um, because they, they might come in and eat your leaves and some of your vegetation and some berries and things. Um, so there are a lot of people who would consider that to be a pest. On the left hand side here, this thing looks so creepy but it's actually a ladybug baby. So it's beautiful and it's beneficial. And when we think of beautiful ladybugs, and I don't know, a couple of people mentioned they saw a ladybug in their vision. And I, I think their ladybug mm -hmm. was a little sweeter than this one. This might not have been the one that landed on your hand, but don't kill him if you see him in your garden because he's going to turn into a beautiful ladybug someday. Um, here we have just a bunch of beneficial insects and then a bunch of harmful or destructive insects. Um, it should also say or animals, quote unquote, pests, what would be considered pests. Um, and then you can just check them out as you want. At the end of the pest ones, though, we do have one that is controversial. Um, it is the cute little caterpillar, um, which will do some damage um, when it's in its small stages. In its infancy, it will um, tear up leaves and greens and whatever it desires. Um, but when you're going to control for caterpillars, just be mindful that that is your pollinator, like future pollinator. So you don't want to just completely eradicate them. Um, you know, you can plant beneficial plants that are specifically for your butterflies and that you're, you know, you allow the caterpillars to, to do their thing on. Um, and, you know, it's just, it's kind of like the circle of the things. Um, you don't want to completely take away the caterpillars. Um, for me, I'm not really one that does um, like to manage for pests just because I'm like, this you know, the, even though I'm growing the stuff, I want to grow in abundance enough where there's some for me, me and my family, some to share. And then some we are obviously going to lose to animals and insects because that's the way of life. And because um, you can't control the outdoors so much, um, even the indoors, the, the animals and the insects they need to eat. So they're going to do their job to find their way to food. 
Um, and so it's okay to share sometimes. Um, so again, some insects might be considered pests um, in their earlier life stages, but it, later on they will be your beneficial. So when controlling for caterpillars, which will consume leaves, seeds and flowers, um, which then will become your fruit, just be aware that those are also your future butterflies. Um, let's see, are there any questions so far? You can unmute yourself or you can also put it in the chat if you have any questions. I have a comment about the tomato worms. Yes. <clears throat> I used to have a problem with them, but because I was watering in a, a trough and you know, it would go around and round and round and round, start at one spot and the place would get really wet and water was everywhere. So the bugs would probably, worms would come out of the ground and then go up and get the, get the tomatoes and also got grub worms as well. But I stopped watering that way, and I have a, a now I would water individually the plants that I had, or now I have a drip system. So the water just goes specifically to the place I want, and I'm not getting problem with the tomato, uh, tomatoes because I don't I'm not putting so much water down, and uh, I still have some grub worms here. But the skunks used to go and dig up the grub worms and dig up the tomatoes next to it, and I had to continue to replant. The tomatoes, especially when they were younger. So I thought I'd share that with you. If you're having trouble with that, you may want to consider going with more specific watering instead of just broad, the whole garden. It might help out. Thank you for sharing that. That actually is really good information, um, especially like for myself when I was doing my plot, I was just watering the entire plot. Um, and so that would be good to know. Um, I appreciate that. And also about the skunks with the, because some people would consider the skunk to be a pest, but it is also benefiting you by eating some of the other more soil pests. Um, so that is kind of just in the cycle of things. There are a couple things in the chat um, from Don. Why are lizards bad in the garden? They're not, I'm sorry if, if I did say that. Lizards are not inherently bad in of themselves. They're not going to go for your plants and they're actually gonna eat bugs. They may eat some of your beneficial bugs. They may eat some of your bad bugs. They're not bad themselves, but for some folks like me, for being such an outdoorsy person, I actually am afraid of lizards. I get very squeamish when my cat brings them inside. So um, <laughs> if you don't want lizards, you know, you might have some praying mantises taking care of some of them, but I'm sure um, there will still be some around. And so that's, that's just the case. But if you have cats, and there's praying mantises and there's lizards eating bugs and everybody is just doing what they do in nature, um, then you'll, you're will you bound to see them still and uh, hopefully not have some an issue grow to point, point where you consider it to be a pest problem or a lizard problem. I don't usually hear of people saying like they have a whole big, like a lizard problem. That would be a lot of lizards in one area. So you're right. Thank you so much for um, sharing that. Let's see. This doesn't scroll so slowly. Is it, it's possible to, uh, it's possible lizards could target, yes. So Joseph did mention that in the chat as well, that lizards can um, help to, to target insects, um, but they're kind of indiscriminate, in which case they will also eat some of your beneficial insects, um, which would help with your pollination. Uh, yes, the tachnid fly kills the monarch butterfly larvae. Um, so for those who aren't familiar with that, fly is actually like a parasitic fly. Um, and so I think it eats at two different stages or multiple stages because at the parasitic stage, um, it actually goes into like the, the larvae and consumes it. Um, so, but there are tons of different beneficial bugs that benefit you by not just being pollinators, which we talked about in the previous workshop, but um, so you have your pollinators, but you also have predatory and parasitic insects that um, target or, you know, prey on the insects that are eating your food products or your flowers or your herbs and things like that. Um, and then you also have like those insects that are doing other jobs inside your garden. 
um, like worms, which you've seen in the beginning photo, that wouldn't be considered a pest because worms are amazing for your soil. I remember when I was a kid, my mom used to always have me collecting worms and putting them when I found them outside, like, oh no, go back and putting them inside the pots. And now I have a, a small worm bin um, that we just started in our apartment um, patio. Let's see. Oh, there's no more in the chat. So if there's anyone else that wants to mute, unmute themselves, um, if you have any questions, if you have comments, if you want to share anything about pests that you've um, encountered in your garden um, or any tricks that you might have to minimizing those pests or um, uh, any of those ways. please feel free to either put it in the chat or unmute yourself if you feel comfortable. Uh, I wanted to say that there are a lot of like natural ways to um, prevent other pests just by planting other plants. Um, so, and a lot of the plants that are beneficial are, you know, herbs and uh, flowers that you might not even know are considered um, repellents against a lot of uh, pests, like basil, for example, or, or bay leaf, even meat, or, or even mint are some examples of just natural things that you can grow. And uh, they, repel like mosquitoes some some of them are aphids um and, and again these these and then you can also use these for you know your food as well so there's definitely a lot of herbs and that you can look into and i have the a master gardening article that i'll, I'll post into the the chat as well with 15 um beneficial plants that'll help you with that just a little that you can guys add to your garden as well Definitely. Thank you for adding that, Joseph. Um, so in our last workshop, we talked about companion planting. I um, mean, a little bit of it kind of spilled over into this workshop as well. When we're talking about um, beneficial insects, we talked about predatory insects, pollinator insects, and those parasitic insects, and the types of plants that actually can be used to attract those types of bugs um, or insects into your garden. So you have pollinator plants. Those are plants that specifically draw towards um, pollinators in your garden. You also have a lot of different um, herbs and flowers that attract not just birds, um, bees, more bushes for the birds and berries and things like that, but you have herbs and things that attract your um, moths, your bees, um, also lace wings and different um, predatory insects that will help to kind of keep your pest um, environment kind of more balanced. Um, there are definitely tons of plants to, um, to plant around your garden kind of interspersed that do multiple things. They're edible, they're medicinal, but they're also um, there to attract beneficial bugs that help out your garden, help out to pollinate your garden so that your fruit grows and things like that um, as well. Um, let's see. So you have just a couple examples of those here. Um, you have some plants that attract pollinators. If you're looking to attract more bees, you can plant things like rosemary and lavender. Um, butterflies love milkweed. Birds like bushes and places where they can actually um, like hide and live and, and things like that. Um, if you want to attract some, some beneficial predator bugs, you can plant things like native yarrow, um, chamomile, nettles, um, some trap plants, which we also discussed at the last workshop on companion planting, these are sacrificial plants that uh, specifically attract a specific type of bug, whether it's um, the harmful insects and you want to use that as a sacrifice, or that can also consider, be considered those plants that, um, that you're using to attract beneficial um, insects that go in and take care of your harmful insects. So you can plant rosemary. Um, it's very beneficial if you plant rosemary upwind from your fruit trees, um, nasturtiums as well, nettles, mustards, which those are also medicinal. 
Um, there are also plants that have a repellent in their scent. So like wormwood and tansy and lemon geranium, those are things that they produce such a strong aroma in the, um, usually in the oils of their, um, their plant matter, whether it's their leaves or like their more of their stems and things of that sort. Those things actually repel mosquitoes and um, ants and some different types of uh pests, as you might say. Um, so you can do things like that, planting them nearby to try to change the smell or to mask the smell of certain things that would normally very much attract um, certain pests. Here are just a couple of examples of DIY pesticides. Um, if anyone has tried to make any of their own, um, you can um, put it in the chat if you'd like, or you can also unmute yourself. I'm just going to share these uh, here, are just a couple that I've actually tried from home, kind of just looking up different recipes online um, and trying them. Some of them were worked and some of them were probably, they worked, but like probably more hassle than it's worth. Like, for example, this one time I did um, the hot peppers. It's the last example here. I boiled hot peppers and the house was just smelling. It was garlic. And my sisters were so mad that the house smelled for days. Um, and I put it into like one of those pressure built sprayers, sprayed it around. I had a few plants um, burn, some bugs died. But I also had some plants burn. And also, um, after a while, the pressure kind of built up and then it kind of like just sprayed out and then got on me. And I smelled like hot peppers and garlic for like days. It was not great. Um, but there are other, these are just a couple other things that I've tried. Um, there are tons of recipes online. You can totally Google like DIY pesticides or like, um, non-chemical pesticides and people are putting up tons of different recipes. If anyone here wants to share some that they have, please feel free to put it in the chat or, um, or also you can unmute yourself. Someone in the chat said um, another pollinator attractor is eucalyptus. Yes. Um, and then, so eucalyptus is amazing. One, it's medicinal for us. It attracts lots of pollinators and beneficials. Um, but you can also use the oil, um, one of the DIY recipes or a few DIY recipes actually, um, actually hint to using the oil of the eucalyptus plant in order to repel mosquitoes um, and some moths as well. So there, it's a multifaceted plant. You could do tons of things with it. Anyone want to unmute themselves and talk about some of their DIY pesticide kind of um, Experiences? I have heard that marigolds uh, deter gophers. So I'm about to try that. I have the marigolds, but I haven't done it. Also, garlic down, uh, minced garlic down the gopher hole has a tendency to do that as well. So I've done a little bit of that. But Gophers, you have to stay, be, be very diligent with anyhow. So wish me luck on my, my project of using marigolds. Plus Good marigolds. luck. And when I was a kid, my parents told me I ate marigolds. So I was going to say marigolds are both edible and they also um, are really good attractors for other um, other insects. And then I heard that they deter another type of pest. Mm, I'll have to think on it because I don't remember and I haven't tried it yet, but I would definitely love to hear feedback if it works for your gophers. Okay. I'll let you know in late spring. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck with that. Thank you. I've actually tried two of the of the things on the list. I've tried diatomaceous earth for ants. It was, uh, we had, a, we have a big, uh, uh, well, not a big tree, but a, a fig tree in a pot in, in the back of our um, place and it a bunch of ants made their home into the pot and the ants found a way into our house and so I used the diatomaceous earth to kind of make a, a border around around the, first the pot itself and then uh, a border around the back door and it is extremely effective in in 
they, they kind of just bump into it and then try to find a way around it. They don't cross that line. It's, it's, it's pretty amazing actually. And then I've also tried, uh, it was kind of like a mix between the orange oil and like, I believe it was mint or peppermint and uh, they don't like that at all. So those two were, seemed pretty, pretty effective for uh, ants and uh, the spray was also for like spiders and other bugs that didn't just like that aroma. Those were two, two good ones. Nice. Thank you for sharing that. And yeah, those ants who wouldn't want a fig tree and those <laughs> things start to get good and get ready to go. They start like having this little stuff secretion from it. The mm. ants just love the figs. Yep. I me too. <laughs> <laughs> Ground cinnamon for keeping ants out. Thank you, T Marsh. I haven't tried that and I have a ton of cinnamon. Um, because if you didn't know, cinnamon is amazing. It has astringent properties and it's very highly medicinal and edible. So <laughs> that's great. I'm going to, I love to try things that have multiple purposes because like it just makes sense, right? You have cinnamon in your kitchen and you can use it as a pest control. You can use it to put in your oatmeal and you could, you know, use it to make a face wash as well. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing those things. Um, and let's see. So again, check us out for our next workshop, which is the plate to plot, regrowing food and kitchen scraps. Um, and just it's composting part A. We get a little bit more into composting when I we'll talk about soils. Um, but in this one, we will briefly talk about composting and how mm -hmm. to start a composting, um, small composting bin you can do um, more cool composting in, in your home. If you have um, a small space or you can, if you have more space, you can get into like the hotter composting piles and bin systems and things of that sort. We'll talk about that more in our next workshop two weeks from now. Um, if you haven't already, please register so that we have a way of contacting you with any updates and also so that we can send out our certificates of completion at the end. Um, and we appreciate you for joining us. Let me unshare and then we will come back and see if there are any questions or any comments. If anyone wants to share any of their pest stories, maybe um, we have a few minutes. And if you have to go, um, we appreciate you so much and thank you for joining us. And, um, and yeah, have a great night. And if you're staying on for a few minutes, please feel free to unmute yourself or also you can put it in the chat, just anything that you would like to say about pests or pest control. You were gonna make some the different, um, different talks available to us. I missed the first one. I haven't yes. seen any email, are you doing that? Are you still doing it? Yes, we do plan to make the recordings available. So if you um, can check out the registration, that way we'll have your email addresses and we will send it out. We're kind of behind. Um, I'm behind in sending out the previous workshops, but I will get all the uh, <laughs> recordings out um, before the end of our workshop series. So right. if you missed one, um, please make sure you get us your email so that we can send it out to you. Okay. And uh, yes, the registration, thank you so much for that. The registration is in the chat, the link to the registration. So I have a question. Just, oh, I'm sorry, did someone else say something? No, sis, you have the floor. Okay, so the cats in the neighborhood have lost their minds and they are finding their way. And you've been to my house, so you know how high that fence is. <laughs> so they are very determined to get into my yard. And, and I keep finding like their droppings and they've just made, um, it's like they made our um, raised beds, their cat, their cat litter. And I don't even know what to do about those freaking gads. Do you have any suggestions, love? I feel sad because I love cats and I love the neighborhood cats, but um, I do understand how that can be very, very um, obnoxious and definitely have seen the cats make a litter box into their, um, into many raised beds. So there are some like plants that um, are, well, 
I don't want to say plants, toxic plants on the outside of your box, because I don't want to see any kitties get hurt. But um, if you plant those plants that are like not desirable to them, the idea is that they will avoid that area. The other thing is they um, usually the like the things that they sell are um, like chemical based. Um, but they do have things that are like spray and they mimic, um, I'm assuming pheromones from other cats. Um, and it's like an, a synthetic kind of form and it sprays around and it's supposed to deter cats. I haven't tried it myself, so I can't say for sure that that works. Um, we have in the chat, cat mats are very effective. Um, they cover sprouting plants and then put them on the perimeter of your raised beds. It keeps cats, rats, bunnies, it keeps them out. And the sprays, the this was, um, says that sprays are useless. So yeah, I mean, with sprays and stuff, I don't know, cause you have to like be spraying constantly if it rains or if the smells change. Um, and some cats just might, might, might be too, like they don't even care. So there are some cats in my complex, they spray in their areas and some of the cats don't, they don't care. They come into their territory anyways. So I'm not sure if like synthetic, like pheromone based cat sprays would be working for every cat. Some cats are um, pretty with it. They're like, they don't care whose territory this is. There's a cat box and some snacks. Um, so I will though, I will look up some other things, Sister Maria, and I'll, um, definitely share with you <laughs> if I find anything else. Um, but cat mats probably will be your best bet. I, have... I wonder though, if your turtle would get stuck. Yeah, the turtle, but we, we have, uh, we have, we, we learned something today about the ants going up on our trees. And we'd like to share that if that's okay. Yes, thank you well, so much. I was talking Some, about that going in the fruit trees. Somebody on the chat said they have ants in their fruit trees, and we have ants in our fruit trees also. Um, I went to the nursery with some of the sad looking leaves from our orange tree to find out what was going on. And it turns out we had aphids, which the ants, as you said, are actually farming. So, so the solution is to get rid of the ants. And um, what we learned, and this is a very non-toxic way to get rid of the ants, you take, they sell this kind of, it's like paper tape that you wrap around the trunk of the tree. And then you put the special glue, I think it's called Tanglefoot on the tape. And so the ants, when they try to go up the tree, they get stuck in the glue. And yes. It's non-toxic. It keeps the ants away. And if the ants are not protecting the aphids, then the natural predators of the aphids will eat them. Yes. Save Thank the you. Thank you so much for sharing that. I saw that on a video and I meant to go back to the video and it was like a DIY hack. And they put, and they put it around just in a ring so that they couldn't continue to travel up. That's and it right. made so much sense. Yeah, and it's totally non-toxic. Thank yes, you. It just happens that we learned that today, a few hours ago. So it was meant to be. It immediately went over and wrapped our trees. <laughs> That's so awesome. Yeah. Oh, let's see. We've got some other chat. Uh, Amazon, also garden suppliers sell cat mats. Um, they're plastic pokey things that are not friendly for cats to walk on. Okay. So that might mean your turtle could be safe, Sister Maria. Uh, cats hate spicy and citrus smells. So a couple of good natural repellents. Um, you can spread some cayenne pepper and some lemon peels. There are also some DIY pesticides that include cayenne and lemon peels or one or the other. So that might work. Um, we have a question in the chat from Rob. Can Tanglefoot go directly on the trunk? I'm not sure if you guys know. Um, 
if you can put the tangle foot directly on the trunk or if you need no, the, the sticky substance no yeah no the the woman at the nursery said don't put it directly on the trunk it's toxic to the trunk that makes sense too if it's like a glue based substance yes. right so yeah. yeah so you have to wrap this little paper and it is it, not expensive you know so that's good it's that's it, good because to do actually i use a piece of rope a little tie line just around it so i don't use tape or anything so it, it the the paper wrapper is just to keep the 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 glue the substance that you put and when you're done you just remove it and the tree is back to whatever normal nice that sounds such like a really great idea uh, for using to get rid of ants y'all because the ants will really bring your aphids back so if you have a huge aphid problem check around i promise you there are ants somewhere ants follow the aphids they we didn't love know them. that the ants actually protect the aphids they do they, they really actually, do yeah they fight everything else so that they protect that because that's the source of their food yes and ants and actually are pretty vicious i don't know if you guys have seen but they will swarm things and i've seen some videos of them taking down some things like 100 times their size and it's just because the numbers and you know it's so yeah ants are ants are definitely going to protect the aphids so yeah. if you have a aphid problem do think about controlling for ants if you have uh, ants on your trees you do have aphid problems yes otherwise they wouldn't go there they may go to your figs you know but it's uh it, i mean the rest of the year they're going after the aphids yes Thank you very much. We enjoy your presentation. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. We appreciate you for uh, all of you for joining us. We have also in the chat, Sister Maria says she tried cayenne before. These cats just added some water and lemon. The cats, <laughs> see, depending on where you are, the cats, animals are so smart and insects are too and that's the thing is they adapt and so when they're in neighborhoods where humans are and where um when they're kind of like losing habitat and and we're also like letting cats go and people um actually you know breed or buy cats so that they can release them out into being their outdoor cats for pest issue for protect you know protection and pest reasons but then we have lots of cats that live outdoors then they're looking for habitats and they're looking for places to go and they tend to adapt to whatever their um, circumstances and, and their environment are. So if there's lots of people um, and people start putting down these pesticides previously known to like, uh, you know, deter them or repel them, some of them just, you know, like learn to get away from it or learn to deal with it. I mean, and lots of animals find their ways of adapting to it. Um, so sometimes it's difficult. I mean, that kind of just leads back to the conversation about what we consider as pests and uh, and or or undesirable, right? What could be a weed to someone might be actually medicinal or edible. Um, what might be a pest to someone might be beneficial. Um, it also might be food. Um, you know, if you have grubs and caterpillars and things of that sort, what if you have chickens? Those might not be a pest. That might be a free food source for you. So um, it's all about how we look at things and, and uh, our interpretation and whether, you know, whether we know what we can be doing with these um, different insects and how we can use them to benefit our garden. So check us out in our next workshop. Thank you again so much for joining us. We're right about time. If anyone has questions, comments, um, please stick around. I will hold on to answer any questions if you wanna unmute yourself, if you wanna put them in the chat. Other than that, thank you again for joining us and have a wonderful evening.
I saw that thing that you put in the chat, Joseph, with the remote sensor for the sprinkler. 